This morning's sermon is entitled, Fellow Servants in the Kingdom. Our passage is Colossians 4, verses 7 through 18. And we're looking at the final portion of Paul's letter today. So these remaining verses in Colossians 4, at first glance, they might seem like uh, slim pickings as far as rich teaching goes. But actually, if we take some time and look a little closer, I hope we'll see that Paul is providing some living examples for us that put flesh on the bones of the skeleton of truth that he's been teaching throughout the body of this letter. And that's very beneficial because when we're taught to do something, when we're given these principles, well, that's one thing. But when we see somebody modeling it, uh, actually demonstrating how to do something, well, that's immensely helpful to us. It's one thing to know what God requires of us in our lives, but to live in close proximity to somebody who is faithful and living it out, well, that's profoundly an impactful relationship as we're discipled and helped to grow. That's kind of what Paul's doing here as he sets forth uh, before the Colossians this long list of people that he wants to commend to them. He wants them to see living examples of some of the things that he has been teaching them in the previous verses throughout the letter. Well, before we read God's word, let's go to him in prayer. Lord, this is your word, and we ask today that you will speak to us. May the Spirit illuminate this text to our minds, to our understanding. Would you transform us for your glory and for our good? In Jesus' name, amen. So beginning at Colossians 4, uh, chapters, uh, verse 7. Uh, Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received constructions, instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Eustace, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of, of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, uh, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, <clears throat> have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. I, and say to Ar Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. M remember my chains. Grace be with you. Well, when I first began studying verses 7 through 18 of Colossians chapter 4, at first glance, seems like a list of unknown names and obscure references, intriguing perhaps, and we'll listen to it with reverence, but seemingly not particularly informative. Yet we're always to study God's Word with the understanding that all Scripture is breathed out by God, that is profitable for teaching, for reproof and correction and training in righteousness. So, if we pay attention to the details, we'll see that what may appear to be an unimportant part of the letter is actually packed full of interest and significance. So this morning we're going to tackle this section together under three headings. And first, I want you to think with me about faithfulness in gospel ministry. Paul commends a number of co-workers that exemplify faithfulness in ministry. And then secondly, fellowship in gospel community. Paul's missionary team itself modeling, is modeling fellowship and unity to the Colossians, who themselves, as we've seen, were struggling with some of those things. So faithfulness in gospel ministry, fellowship in gospel community, and thirdly, there's forgiveness in gospel relationships. And some of the names here <clears throat> uh, call for forgiveness from the Colossians, as we'll see Paul himself models forgiveness in his behavior. So point one on our outline then, faithfulness in gospel ministry. Let's think about the first of those. Uh, isn't it helpful to notice the, the first person that Paul commends to them is Tychicus in verse 7, whose ministry is really not at all public or upfront or spectacular, but notice 
He says, Tychicus is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, or better, a fellow bondservant in the Lord. Clearly, Tychicus is someone Paul trusts and honors and loves. He is a co-worker that can be depended upon, and he wants to commend him to the Colossians. Now, we first meet Tychicus back in Acts chapter 20, verse 4, where he's listed as part of Paul's multi-ethnic, multinational mission team. And then we come across him again in Ephesians 6, 21, and in Titus 3, 12, and here in Colossians 4, 7. What we discover is that Tychicus is the person most frequently sent by the apostle to the churches that he has planted, probably as the bearer of, the, of, his, of his letter to them. <clears throat> and to let the Christians there know how things are going with Paul. I mean, that's precisely what Paul says in verse 8. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your heart. I guess you might call Tychicus the apostolic mailman. It's his ministry, it's his work, it's a simple ministry, it's not dramatic. Uh, he doesn't have a personal following. He's not somebody on a platform anywhere wowing people with his oratory skills. Instead, he traveled behind the Apostle Paul around all the cities that he has visited to the congregations associated with him, simply delivering the Apostle's letters. So we need to realize that not all ministry is public, as if somehow it needs to be public in order for it to be valid or significant. So very important ministry is carried out in the background. Some, some ministry has a vital supporting role. That was Tychicus. And yet his ministry made Paul's ministry possible and effective. It's because Tychicus was faithful in his task that the letters that Paul wrote reached their destinations. I don't think it's a stretch to say that because of Tychicus' work, seemingly mundane and unglamorous, perhaps overlooked at times, we actually have much of what we call the New Testament. And so if, if, if you have a supporting ministry, a quiet, you know, backroom work, if your ministry is unglamorous and basic and even overlooked or often ignored, remember Tychicus and be encouraged because what he did was a vital work. It's not the admiration and praise of men that define importance or value of a ministry. It's being a beloved brother or sister, a faithful minister, a fellow slave in the Lord. That's what really counts, faithfulness to the task that's been entrusted to us. And then staying with this theme of faithfulness, look at Epaphras in verses 12 and 13. Do you see what he says there about Epaphras? He was first introduced in the letter back in chapter 1, verse 7, where Paul uses the same language for Epaphras that he has already used in our passage for Tychicus, that he is a faithful minister in Christ. Paul says it was from Epaphras that the Colossians came to know Jesus. It was from him that they first heard the gospel. He was their first pastor, the church planter there at Colossae. And now here in verse 12, Paul teases out for us with some detail the contours of Epaphras' faithfulness as a gospel minister. Look what he says in verse 12. First of all, he says, Epaphras is always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Now, he, he evangelized them, and he had taught them in his preaching ministry. He was their pastor. But what Paul remarks upon, the thing that stands out for Paul, the great characteristic of Epaphras' ministry, was not so much his preaching or his evangelistic success, it was his prayerfulness. The fact that he struggled in prayer on their behalf. Now, I'll confess, I find that to be a stinging reminder to me of my primary business as a preacher. My first business is, is prayer. It isn't even preaching or pastoring or administration or leadership. It's prayer. Prayer is the heart of my business as a minister of the gospel. You remember in Acts 6 when the dispute arose in the early church over the daily distribution of food and the Hellenistic widows that were being neglected and the burden of the administration of that was too much for the apostles and so the first deacons were appointed. Then the apostles said, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. The order is important. Prayer is the priority. And then the ministry of the Word flows out of their prayerfulness. And we should not overlook the always there. Epaphras always prayed for them. He was diligent and consistent. He never neglected to pray to God for the flock that was entrusted to him. But more than that, he always struggled in prayer for them. Now that's challenging. When was the last time you wrestled or struggled in your prayers for someone else. 
There's a holy wrestling, a, a deep burden, an appropriate and proper concern for the spiritual welfare that's weighing upon him. And so he struggles, he wrestles. <clears throat> he uses a Greek word there from which we get our English word, agony. There's a vigorous personal investment and a wrestling with God for the welfare of the people of God. And notice what he prays for. He prays for their maturity and for full assurance in the will of God. Epaphras is not interested in merely introducing people to Jesus through the gospel and having them respond to his message, although that is important. But that's not the de his definition of success in ministry. It's not a room packed, filled to the rafters with people. That's not his definition of success. His goal is not merely numerical increase. Although we want to see that, we want to see the kingdom grow, people come into our midst. His goal is Christian maturity. Yes, he wants to see people coming to church. He wants to see them professing faith in Christ. But he wants them to grow up into him who is the head. He wants maturity and full assurance. And he knows that that is utterly beyond him. It's not something he can manufacture. It's not something he can create or cause by the force of his rhetoric. And so he is cast back upon God and he wrestles with God for them in prayer. You know, you can preach your heart out every Lord's day. But if you don't pray down heaven, then what hope of success do you have for all of your pulpit labors? You can shepherd and counsel and take time to visit the flock. But what hope can you cherish of helping anyone in spiritual things if you will not struggle on their behalf in prayer? Prayer is the work of ministry. We have a burden of prayer and the ministry of the Word. Will you please pray and insist and encourage your ministers and your elders to spend a significant time each week in prayer, pleading with God for the good of the, of the flock. Prayer is the, is the work of ministry. Notice also that Epaphras is committed not just for his wrestling in prayer, but for his hard work in verse 13. I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those at Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Epaphras is a hard worker. He, he works hard not just for the Colossians, his own local congregation, but he works hard for all of God's people in his presbytery, in, in the churches in the Lycus Valley, in Laodicea, and in Hierapolis. Now sometimes I suspect people may get into ministry because they think it's an easy option. And I suspect some church members think pastors maybe don't know the meaning of hard work, although I don't sense that about our congregation here. But in all fairness, some pastors give church members reason to think that their pastors don't know the meaning of hard work. The faithfulness, however, in ministry that God gives us, it demands hard work. And sometimes that work is very costly. The cost involved in ministry may actually be what's behind Paul's exhortation here to Archippus in verse 17. Do you see his exhortation? See that you fulfill the ministry you have received in the Lord. There's something going on with Archippus. He, and he needs a, a word of encouragement to finish the work and to fulfill his ministry. Sometimes the work of ministry is, is exceedingly hard. There's a significant personal cost that has to be paid. And often those of us who are serving in ministry, we need a verse like, uh, need an encouragement like verse 17. And somebody to come and say, you have to press on, finish the race, fulfill your ministry. And many of you are actually very good to encourage Chad and me. Some of you have a real gift of encouragement. We've often been on the receiving end of that. And over and over, you've not only said nice and kind things, but you've encouraged us to, to press on, keep going. If that's a gift the Lord has given you, then please cultivate it. Because we need somebody like Paul saying to us, as he does to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you've received from the Lord. So Paul's teaching us here about faithfulness in gospel ministry, what it looks like, how you can pray for your pastors and your leaders. Well, here's how. Faithfulness in the mundane things. You know, in the things that people don't see and don't notice even. Faithfulness in ministries like the ministries of, of Tychicus. And faithfulness in the great spiritual priorities and burdens of a pastor's heart, seen in men like Epaphras and Archippus. Faithfulness. Then secondly, this is point two on our outline, notice with me fellowship and gospel community. When you step back a little bit from Paul's list, you'll notice that the team Paul has assembled around him models in a wonderful way the power of the gospel to build of the many one body in Christ. 
For example, in verse 9 and again in verse 12, speaking of Onesimus and Epaphras, Paul says of both of them to the Colossians, These men are one of you. They're Greek-speaking Gentiles who've come from Colossae. Colossae is, is in the Roman province of Asia, which is modern Turkey. And likewise, Luke is the beloved physician, but he's a Gentile. He's actually the only non-Jewish author of the, of the New Testament. But then on the other hand, look at verses 10 and 11 where Aristarchus and Mark and, and Eustace are mentioned. Paul says to them, These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. So these are Jewish co-workers. We've seen them before, haven't we? That there are tensions in Colossae because the false teachers are fracturing their fellowship together. And the question of how to relate to the Jewish ceremonial law was at the very heart of those tensions. Chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 deals with circumcision. Chapter 2, verse 16 deals with new moons and festivals and Sabbaths. The issue of how Gentiles and Jews relate to one another was tearing at the fabric of their fellowship. But here in Paul's ministry team, we see the way that the true gospel, the gospel that Paul has been teaching them and correcting the Colossians on for four chapters now, that gospel brings together diverse people and unites them and makes them one in Christ Jesus. Now, do notice carefully, Paul does not say that the gospel obliterates the difference, that it erases it. I think it's useful, he reminds the Colossians, that Onesimus and Epaphras, these are men who come from your hometown. That's what he's saying. It's also helpful to see that Paul takes personal comfort in knowing that he has a few who are Jewish followers in Jesus the Messiah, who stand with him in the work. Now, here's why I've, what I find to be helpful. You know, sometimes I hear people talking about being colorblind in terms of race. Uh, you, you've heard that expression, you know, I'm, I'm colorblind. And that's well-intentioned. And I've even said that myself because what I mean is, well, the differences in ethnicity really don't matter to me. And that is true. But we're really not to be colorblind as if those differences of ethnicity and culture just should be ignored completely. No, we need to acknowledge and celebrate and learn from those things, not ignore them. Actually, we're not to be colorblind. To be more accurate, we're to be colorful, right? The gospel doesn't obliterate diversity, but it, it beautifies it. It helps us to see the glory of the work of God in the lives of men and women from every tribe and language and people and nation, and all the variegated glory of human beings made in the image of their Creator. The gospel takes us in all our differences, and it doesn't obliterate those differences, but it helps us stand together and celebrate our difference and to learn from one another in it, all united around the truth. All that to say the church militant, the church here on earth, must strive to look as much like the church triumphant, the church in heaven, as it can. That is what our sanctification requires. It's our preparation for glory and it happens not just in an individual's life, but it happens among us in our fellowship. And that means not that the church should look as much like the world as possible, not that the church should look like the community, as much as, like the community around us as possible, but that the church should look like the kingdom of Jesus Christ as much as possible, made up of people from every tribe and language and nation. And Paul's modeling that reality to the Colossians who are really being challenged by that as the fabric of their fellowship is under real pressure. And notice it's not just ethnicity that the gospel transcends. It transcends economics and class. Paul himself is an aristocrat. He's well-educated. He's ethnically, he's a Jewish Roman citizen. But Luke is a doctor. He's a physician. And then there is Onesimus. You remember him? Well, what's his class, his socioeconomic strata? He's a runaway slave. Philemon, his master, is a member of this congregation in Colossae. So this is about as diverse a team, you know, both ethnically and socioeconomically, as a person could hope to ask for. And just think about that for a moment. Was it messy and problematic and uncomfortable for Paul when Onesimus, the runaway slave, came to faith in Jesus? And, how, and now he has to go back to the church in Colossae and face Philemon? Well, if you read the, 
the letter to Philemon, the answer is undoubtedly yes. But that's the dynamic of the gospel in the midst of human relationships. It's messy. It's uncomfortable. And Paul's not at all afraid to wade into that. The gospel crosses, it transcends boundaries of class and education and ethnicity and, and, and economics. And it, Paul speaks freely of his, of his love for these men. He depends on them in partnership for the work of the gospel, and they depend on him. If the Colossians were worried about unity while under siege from the false teachers, well, Paul's team is a reminder that, that, that the gospel he has been teaching them in this very letter, well, that overcomes division. It doesn't erase the difference, but it overcomes the division, and it makes us one in Christ. So we have faithfulness, and we have fellowship, and then thirdly, and behind the fellowship that they enjoy is, point three on your outline, forgiveness in gospel relationships. Onesimus here is case in point. Paul sending him back with Tychicus to Colossae. Tychicus is carrying two letters, one letter for the congregation, the letter to the Colossians, and a personal letter from Paul to Philemon, Onesimus' master. And Paul is urging them to be reconciled to one another because there is to be forgiveness between them. He urges Philemon to receive Onesimus. You can read that in Philemon 16. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother. So forgiveness and reconciliation. And the call to forgiveness that Paul is issuing in Onesimus' case is actually a forgiveness, a reconciliation that he himself is modeling right here. Notice verse 10 in the mention of Mark, the cousin of Barnabas concerning of whom you've received instruction. If he comes to you, he says, welcome him. Now, you may know Mark's story. We first meet him. His other name is John, John Mark, in Acts chapter 12, verse 12. And he lives in his home with his mother Mary in the city of Jerusalem. The church meets there for prayer. And Saul, as he was called in the early chapters of the book of Acts, and Barnabas, when they set out on a missionary journey, well, they take John Mark along with them. We find, them, we find him next in Acts 13, verse 5, on a mission with Paul and the team in Cyprus. But then Luke tells us in the book of Acts, for a reason not given, Mark abandons the team and he returns to Jerusalem. That's in Acts 13, verse 13. Well, next we come into contact with Mark in Acts 15. Paul and Barnabas, they've completed their first circuit of the churches and they're, they're about to return to encourage the churches that they've planted. And Barnabas, the son of encouragement, he wants to take Mark along with them. You know, poor Mark, he, he bailed on us before, but let's give him another chance. Let's take him along with us. But on the other hand, he doesn't think, Paul doesn't think, that it's wise to take someone who had already left them once before. You know, I mean, Mark abandoned us when we needed him. So Barnabas, I'm not so sure it's wise to take him on this journey. In fact, Luke says they differed so sharply to the point that their fellowship was broken and the team separated. And Barnabas took John Mark to Cyprus, and Paul took Silas, and he went back to Asia. But just as an aside, isn't it wonderful and helpful to see the New Testament be so honest? Paul and Barnabas have a fight. It breaks their fellowship. And what is the lesson? Well, even the best of men are mere men at best. Isn't that so? We're good at saying that, but when it happens right in front of us, we, we can kind of easily forget it. I'm so grateful for the reminder, though, in the New Testament that the best of men are mere men at best. So that when we see our best men stumble and fall and their egos get in the way and they say stupid things, as your leaders inevitably will, we ought to learn from the Scriptures well, we need to be patient. We're all under reconstruction. We're all works in progress. We all ought to cut one another some slack. And notice the power of the gospel to overcome all of that and effect reconciliation. And here's Mark again. And now he's being commended to the Colossians by Paul. At the very end of Paul's life in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 11, Paul is imprisoned again. And he says, everyone has abandoned me except for Luke. And he's writing to Timothy and he gives him various instructions. And one of the things he wants is he's... On the home stretch, as it were, he wants to finish well. 
Well, the person he wants by his side is Mark. He says, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Now, before he had all kinds of doubts about him, but now as his own ministry winds down, Mark is the one he wants beside him as he goes down the home stretch. Look, the gospel is no guarantee that division and interpersonal conflict will not happen. But the gospel is the power of God to mend rifts between us when they appear. And the forgiveness that Paul calls for between Philemon and Onesimus is a forgiveness that he himself is modeling in his team right here at the end of the book of Colossians. Faithfulness, fellowship, forgiveness. We need to learn to forgive one another because God in Christ has forgiven us. Forgive as you yourself have been forgiven. You, know, you and I are recipients of redeeming grace. The fact that God is not counting our transgressions against us. Rather, He gave His own Son for our pardon. So how can we then legitimately hold a grudge? How will we then refuse to forgive others who have wounded us and sinned against us? We're to forgive as we've been forgiven. The gospel creates true fellowship built on a readiness to forgive. So faithfulness, fellowship, forgiveness. Now one more thing before we conclude. Notice the name Demas in verse 14. Demas is being commended like everyone else to the Colossians. But in 2 Timothy, at the end of Paul's life, in that letter, that same letter we talked about a moment ago, letter to Timothy where he's calling for Mark, he wants Mark to come with Timothy to Rome. In that same letter, we're told in chapter 4, verse 10, Demas, in love with the world, has deserted me. Now, Mark had deserted Paul too at one point. So what's the difference? Well, the great difference is that Mark's faith in Christ and his love for his Savior and his love for the lost was never in question. Whatever his reasons for leaving, whether it was his insecurity, maybe it was a fear of men, maybe it was that he was just exhausted and burned out, whatever issue was pressing upon him that he just couldn't work through or get past, whatever his reason for leaving, Mark is restored. But Demas, well, the great difference is Demas loved the world. The world owned his heart. Ultimately, the love of the world directed his steps and ordered his priorities. Now, that's a challenging and sobering thing to notice Demas here, isn't it? Because here he is being commended. So far as Paul knows, Demas is part of the team. Uh, he's a trusted and reliable friend. He looked the part. He talked the part. He played the part. But in reality, he loved the world. Demas is a warning to us about the real danger of spiritual fraud and of being a counterfeit. In the midst of our affluent cu uh, culture where we're, things are easy for the most part, it isn't the love of the world a real temptation for us? How hard is it to give up the love of the world, and the things of the world. Look, if you profess to follow Jesus, you need to know there will come a time when you will have to decide. Will I pick up my cross and follow Jesus and do what He's commanding me to do? Rely upon His Word, the guidance of Holy Spirit? Will I go to Him outside the camp bearing His reproach? Or will I be like Demas and just desert my post? Because when push comes to shove, well, I love the world more than I love my Savior. Will the love of the world rule your heart? Will the love of the world order your priorities? Will you slide back into the world's paradigm? Or will you stand for Christ? Not counting the cost by all means, but yet ready to bear it, whatever it might be. It's actually the flip side of faithfulness, isn't it? We began by thinking about faithfulness, so which will it be? Faithfulness, fellowship, and forgiveness, glorious and beautiful realities that Christ gives to us and He works between us through the gospel, things that are available to those who bend the knee in their frailties and say, Lord, I believe. Will you help my unbelief? I'm willing, but my spirit, my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. I am scared to death about what this is going to mean for me, but I'm willing. Will you help me? To such as those who will hum humble themselves, well, that com comes faithfulness. Faithfulness from God, faithfulness of the Lord, and the, and the fellowship, the fellowship of the saints to stand with you and strengthen you in the face of challenge and forgiveness. 
for when you stumble and fall. But there's always a danger of being content with superficiality and of saying the right thing and acting the part, but ultimately just being a fraud because, well, you love the world. Being warned about the, the love of the world that leads one that even the Apostle Paul would commend, and yet still he deserted his post. So does the love of Christ have hold of your heart? Does the love of Christ direct your priorities and your daily steps? Because it is the only safe path to take. The love of Jesus Christ, costly as it is, and Paul teaches that too, doesn't he? Lord, we thank you for the mighty power of the good news that is at work in us and the faithfulness that it requires from us. We pray for our, our elders and our deacons and our Sunday school teachers and our pastors. Lord, give us faithfulness to wrestle in prayer, to struggle mightily, to work hard for the people of God entrusted to us. And we pray, O oh Lord, for our fellowship. Will you make us one? Make us glorious in the diversity of your kingdom. Make us one in Jesus Christ. And do that by working in us and between us a readiness to forgive, that we will be practitioners of gospel reconciliation like Onesimus and Philemon or Paul and Mark. And Lord, will you deliver us from the love of the world so that after having said so much that is true and good, that we are not found in, at last, in fact, to be frauds. Lord, will you do this all for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.